Welcome to the second day of the Meeting of Minds conference. Um, I hope you all enjoyed yesterday. I thought it was a fantastic range of uh, um, talks. So obviously, it started pretty poorly, but it did get better <laughs> during the day. Um, <laughs> uh, and today, we have, we have a, an equally impressive lineup. Um, we're going to start off with, uh, with Joe, who um, it's quite worrying to realize that we've known each other for more than 30 years. I'm, I'm, it's impossible, isn't it? You look at the two of us, you just couldn't believe that we've <laughs> we known each other for that long. <laughs> you know, it's, um, but um, Joe is, uh, I think, recognized as, as uh, one of the, well, yeah, I think one of the greatest landscape photographers in the UK at the moment. And, uh, and I've always admired his work. And we do very different things, but, but I think we have a, a quite a, yeah, I think there's a mutual respect. I'm like, no. <laughs> 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 uh, and uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to to seeing. It. So you're going to sort of talk about. Uh, he's, he's kept this very quiet. Uh, well, uh, I have, <coughs> I have. Yeah, just a, a little bit about. It's more of an overview, uh, but there's also I'm trying to dig a bit deeper into the background philosophy as well later on. Right. So I'll try okay. and explain it as we want to start. Okay. Well, put your hands together for Joe Cornish. Thank you very much, everybody. Well, it's, it's a real thrill to be here. Fantastic to see so many people again. Anybody not here yesterday? Quick show of hands. Give us a, you were un unlucky, missed out. But anyway, hopefully you really enjoyed today as well. Uh, and we will see how it goes. Uh, I'm going to kick off the morning. Um, and I'm glad that, in a way, I'm not having to follow Jem Southern. Follow that, my goodness me. Um, absolutely impossible. So, Jem, wherever you are, thank you so much for yesterday's talk. That was, and everybody who spoke yesterday was, was amazing. Uh, okay, now, in theory, I'm showing uh, work that is not well known, but that's a very difficult thing for me to uh, talk about in isolation. And also, I don't know what's well known and, uh, and what isn't. What I do know is that most of the work that I'm showing is relatively recent work, so I hope it'll be fresh uh, for most of you, if anybody does actually have a look at my photographs, um, and uh, that I'll be able to make some sense of it. The way I've tried to do that is to break it up into three distinct parts. And if, if I don't waffle on too long, there'll be time for Q&A at the end as well. And in essence, I see, it was very, very interesting, by the way, uh, to just reflect on what Rafa talked about yesterday, the way he'd structured uh, the life of a photographer, the expressive meaning of, of what we do. Uh, and I found that really, really illuminating. And in a sense, mine is just a slightly less well-organized version, um, but with, with more pictures, probably. Uh, and I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about technique. Uh, which is the, the platform, the foundation of what we do. Uh, I will obviously be relating it to my own experience, but I hope it will resonate for everyone in various ways. Uh, I have a one or two quotes included as well, and I'm also going to show some pictures by other photographers and other artists as we go through. And I hope that all of this will have some meaning, some resonance uh, for you personally, uh, rather than it being about me, because in that sense, it's not intended to be. Now, this, to me, is a very true quote. Uh, it is very important to have personal input, as, as Rafa uh, so eloquently described yesterday, and as Jem proved so brilliantly uh, in his afternoon talk. And. I don't know if anyone else was listening to the news last night or this morning, but uh, I th had this quote in already, uh, and then Robert Knox Johnston turns up on the news this morning to, at the age of 75, uh, having come third in the, uh, I forget the name of the, of the transatlantic race, uh, the route to rum, I think it's called. Uh, and for me, that, as somebody who's 56, um, I found that really, really inspiring. I've still got 21 years to get to Robin Knox Johnston's age, and, and if I could still be anywhere near as fit and lively and, uh, and uh, as excited about adventures as he is, that would, that would be something to aspire to. Now, the idea of, 
of practice, practicalities and perseverance is really just to, to identify that, that the fundamentals of what we do is process, uh, practice. And, and many of the things that make it exciting for me is because it's not easy. So I, I love to work in the rain. And that might seem like a strange thing to say. It is difficult working in the rain. This battle with the elements, with rain on the lens, on the filter, all over the equipment. And yet, the pictures that can be made in the rain are surprising. Uh, and, and because they're difficult, they are that much more rewarding. And to a large extent, I think that is what our photography is about personal rewards. If you work in the snow, in order to make good photographs in, uh, might be different, I would imagine, in Sweden and Norway, uh, as Hans will probably uh, be able to uh, describe later. But when you're in the UK, snow tends to be a very short-lived phenomenon, especially when you're by the sea. So you have to go out in it. And that, in this case, meant standing in the snow all afternoon. I did actually make some photographs while it was snowing as well, but the light was so flat and so dull that it was probably this moment, just as it's starting to get dark and the street lights have come on and provide that little extra uh, element of color that I feel animates the picture for me. A different kind of difficulty is working, well, in more extreme snow conditions, some of you who know the Cairngorms well will probably recognize that this is the Larry Grew. And the Cairngorms are not always the most easy mountains to, to photograph because they are not the sort of spiky, wondrous peaks of the West, but rather more uh, soft, large, rounded hills. Uh, and, and yet they have an amazing atmosphere, brilliant part of the world to work, I think. One of the attractions of them is that the remote center of the Cairngorms is a long way from the road. So to get to here, to the center of the Larry Grew, is at the very least a seven or eight mile walk. And in order to get a picture at dawn, you either have to walk through the night or you're going to walk in the previous day, which is what I did. Seven miles, an easy walk to the, you would think, to the Bothy. No steep bits. But it took me all day, it took me seven hours to walk there because I was breaking trail the whole way, carrying 20, over 20 kilograms of, of gear. And although the photograph may not mean anything to you personally, it does to me. And that is a very important part of, of photography for me. It's about my personal memories and the meanings behind it. And I think it was Jean-Luc Sieff who said that I take photographs for me, and if anyone else likes them, well, that's too bad. <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm quite as, uh, as confident as that. I still am happy if other people like my photographs, uh, but it's nevertheless a, uh, an important part of the, um, the, experience, the most important part of the experience is the experience of being out there. The, Ken, the, the Larry Grew in the Cairngorms is surrounded by Britain's second, third, fourth, and I think fifth highest mountains. So that's Ben McDewey and the Cairngorm and Bray Riach and Cairn Tool. And this is, in fact, between the Cairngorm and Ben McDewey on the Feth Bui saddle. Uh, it's, it's well over Munro height here. It's about uh, 1,000 meters above sea level. I camped up here with my friend Ken, who is my sort of erstwhile climbing partner, and looking forward to a, a day of brilliant sunshine, which we'd been promised by the, by the dear Met Office. Uh, and it was overcast all day. Uh, and having looked at Gem's pictures all yesterday afternoon, uh, I've begun to realize that uh, there's a great deal of merit in having very little sunlight. Uh, but at the time, I probably felt quite challenged by it. And actually, in many ways, it is that kind of challenge when the weather doesn't play ball that produces pictures that, for me personally, are often more memorable. Well, struggling to the tops of mountains isn't something I, I do every day, but it, it, it is something that really embeds itself in memory. It's, it's part of, of a personal identity 
for me. Uh, and, and a lot of it is, is simply the, the testing challenging myself. I don't see it as conquering mountains. I see it as, uh, as being privileged to have the opportunity to, to climb and to see the world from a different viewpoint. Sometimes those viewpoints uh, are in themselves very difficult to interpret. This is on Aran, and there's this huge valley, uh, dark, full of shadow between me and the, the peaks in the distance. So the challenge here really is how to make sense compositionally of a space that is, is awkward. Uh, and I remember at the time thinking, well, perhaps it's just got to be about shape. So the crucial element, you could say, is this related to the curve behind and everything else seems to fall into place. But there's an awful lot that's being processed as well about the quality of light. And it was only really this fairly short period of time as the sun was setting where that image really made sense for me. Another type of practical problem is sinking up to one's knees in sticky mud while being uh, eaten alive by midges. Uh, and I'm sure that many of you have worked in Scotland in the summer some might say it's a mistake to go there between the middle of June and the end of September. And I must say that I generally avoid it. But this summer, I happened to, uh, my son was working in the north of Scotland doing a geomapping project. And my other half, who's still an anxious mum, uh, thought that we should go up there and cook for the boys for the first four, day, four days or so of them being there, which they certainly didn't need. But anyway, it helped to calm her nerves. Um, and it was a good opportunity for me to photograph one of my favourite mountains in Scotland, which is Ben Loyal. I've actually climbed that mountain twice and never got a single picture that was worth anything uh, from its summit. But it is a wonderful, a wonderful mountain set in the landscape in, a, in the most remarkable part of the world. Now, in terms of practice, I think that uh, it's probably the case, most, most of you will shoot digital most of the time, and that's true for me most of the time. But I use quite a few different cameras for different circumstances and different challenges. A couple of years ago, I went to Ladakh with some dear friends and walked in the, uh, in the Zanskar Valley. In order to, to get to the Zanskar Valley, we had three days on the road. Uh, which included an overnight stop here at Rangdom uh, in the high Himalaya in the north, very, very far north of India. A remarkable place. But what we did know is that within a couple of days we were going to be away from an electricity supply for the best part of two weeks. So rather than take a digital camera, well, I did take a digital camera uh, as well, uh, but my main working camera was for this experience was a Hasselblad. 503CW, and hence the, the, the uh, square shape here. Uh, and I still love working this way. Why did I use a Hasselblad? Simply because no need for electricity. The whole thing's mechanical. And I use color negative film. And, uh, and that was an important part of the practice here. This is from from a, a viewpoint that I call Heartbreak Hill. It's actually uh, now nearly four and a half thousand meters above sea level, looking down on the Zanskar Valley, which is very dry, as you can see. But this is an image I had in my mind uh, of the place before I went. Now, it's not something that I aim for, by the way. I generally travel these days much more without a, a preset plan, but occasionally uh, a, a kind of pre-visualized image can provide some guidance. and. Uh, and a thought process that, that's useful. Uh, and the, the main practical difficulty is, here is, is coping with the headache and the dehydration and the general feeling of discomfort uh, when the air pressure is so low that oxygen, uh, there's really not en en enough oxygen to make it comfortable. However, uh, when it comes to this kind of issue, we'll hear a lot more about oxygen deficit later today uh, when we have Alan Hinks on stage. So looking forward to finding out how on earth you take a photograph at 8,000 meters, nearly twice as high as I am here. Perhaps the most important thing uh, about practice for me is, is to continue to photograph while I'm at home. 
Uh, I, I love going out with my camera, as Jim was saying yesterday. Uh, ultimately, that's probably the, the most fundamentally important part of being a photographer is just the passion for making pictures in the round, just the, the enjoyment of being outdoors and just getting to know your own patch. Uh, and, and that's, it, it keeps you, uh, I like to think, fluent with the idea of making pictures with understanding light uh, and that language. And also, when you work locally, uh, you develop a connection with your local landscape. And in some cases, that also means with the local people uh, who, for whom perhaps a landscape like this, uh, as rather brutal as it might appear, is also a source of pride and real meaning uh, for people who live in that area. This is Chemical Works at, at Redcar, uh, which is just down the road from where I live. And the blast furnace uh, at, at Redcar also. Used to be British Steel, now Tata. Uh, and the image here is quite deliberately uh, intended to uh, give a feeling of those dark satanic mills. But that's not the only kind of interpretation that could be made of this subject. Sorry about the clicker. Uh, and in many ways, this place uh, I actually associate as a, uh, as a very interesting uh, part of, of our landscape. To the north of the red car steel blast, uh, blast furnace is several, probably hundreds of acres of wasteland. Uh, difficult to use that term in a way, but that's how it's generally regarded locally. Uh, it was an area that, during the early years of steel manufacturing uh, on Tees side, was used for just dumping heavy metals and the byproducts of the steel making process. They don't do that now uh, because everybody's cleaned up their environment, environmental act, uh, and rightly so. But nevertheless, this huge area is still very toxic. Uh, and, and yet, as time goes by, and the seasons come and go, and the rain falls, the wind blows, and the sun shines. So, the, uh, so nature has started to recover, and it's quite fantastic each year, each summer, to go into that wasteland area and find wildflowers thriving in what was once a highly polluted area. So, this picture is a deliberate intention. Uh, you know, has that deliberate intention to contrast uh, the kind of recovering nature with the still existing active steelworks. Perhaps of all the things that are part of photographic practice that I enjoy the most, I would say that composition uh, as an exercise is the most important one. During dinner yesterday, David quoted Ansel Adams with uh, the most important thing in photography is knowing where to stand. Uh, said presumably slightly tongue-in-cheek, but there's an awful lot in that. And it's often the case that literally a few inches or even millimetres of, of difference in up, down, left, right, in, out, as it were, with the, with the camera lens, will alter the shape, the flow, the positioning, the proportions, and the feeling of perspective in a photograph. And it's often especially crucial uh, in architecture, and especially a picture like this, where there are, are, are many different elements that have to be combined. Now, a slightly different kind of challenge is one that's presented when you're on the deck of a ship. And I've been fantastically lucky the last couple of years to have traveled to the polar regions, both to the Antarctic and also to the Arctic. And uh, the novelty of that is, is pretty sensational, uh, naturally enough. But it can be frustrating, because an awful lot of the time, especially in the Arctic, where you, there are relatively few landing opportunities, uh, then the photographs that one makes tend to be from the deck of a ship, which means that you're remote. You're literally away from the subject matter. You're, you're as it were, regarding it from a distance. And in order to make sense of it, that often means using a very either a very long lens or, or a long lens. Uh, and, and that in itself imparts, I think, a more detached, emotionally detached view. 
And I suppose that for me, the excitement of, of someone like this, I, I, I really want to communicate it. And, and it is difficult to convey without having that tactile feeling of being very physically close to the subject. There is a standoff quality about a long lens, and yet, nevertheless, it is a wonderful opportunity and experience. And after a little bit of time goes by, you stu soon start to develop tactics to, uh, to help to convey that feeling of emotion without perhaps the, the sorts of, uh, of tactics that, that one would normally use. Uh, and here's another picture made from the deck of the ship. This is of the wake of the ship while it's moving very slowly through an area of sheltered water, just reflecting the broken uh, grey sky above us with some little white patches that have refracted through the pattern of the water. And I find working on abstractions is a really, really good exercise visually. I always feel that if you can make make good abstractions or abstract photographs, then it tends to in, improve your sense of how pictures work with literal compositions as well. If you've ever traveled on an expedition ship, you'll know that you're likely to spend some time in a rib, a zodiac, an inflatable boat uh, out on the water, uh, which is wonderful for wildlife watching, a little bit harder for landscape photography, uh, especially those of us who are obsessive about level horizons. The boat is so often bobbing about. Uh, and this is shot from a, a Zodiac in just off Bailey Head, uh, Deception Island in Antarctica. And finally in this section, uh, this very different <laughs> location, I'm sure you'll all recognize it as Hadrian's Wall. It's a very familiar spot a very familiar place. And in many ways, I think one of the biggest challenges for us as photographers is to tackle familiar subjects and still convey a feeling of excitement and passion, uh, for want of a better word, uh, but at least a, a feeling of connection uh, and of the, the special quality uh, of that place. Uh, in terms of practice, why this matters to me is that this is part of uh, professional assignment work for uh, the British Tourist Authority, uh, which I'm fortunate to do from time to time. Uh, and so part of my practice is also very much based on problem solving, is having to provide something for a client as opposed to purely for my own pleasure. Uh, because I must admit, I, I might not necessarily get up very early in the morning and go out and photograph Hadrian's Wall because I know it's a flipping difficult thing uh, to describe almost at any time of year. Uh, it runs pretty much east-west across the north of England and that means that the way it's illuminated make it very awkward uh, to get uh, a, a, the, the sort of synthesis of light and shade that, that brings it to life. Big open landscape, you need, a, a, I suppose, a sky that uh, has some feeling of depth and atmosphere uh, to engage the viewer. That has to happen uh, because otherwise people won't pay attention and clearly that's necessary for this kind of photography. So the next section concerns what you might call the more artistic elements uh, of what we do. And I mean, this is a, a very multi-layered area. Uh, I would put it under the general title of art. But perhaps to break it down in this way, I hope, is, is helpful. Because ideas are what photography, I think, fundamentally is about. Ideas and, in a sense, storytelling. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But for me, ideas don't come from nowhere. They do, as Jem was saying yesterday, come from one's whole life from childhood, fundamentally, uh, but also from the myriad of influences that there are around us. And for many of us, that will mean looking at the work of other photographers, but there are plenty of other sources too. Uh, and I think it's quite helpful to, when you reflect on your own photography, to unpick where some of your ideas have come from, uh, whether it is from Thomas the Tank Engine, 
as Jem was explaining yesterday, or from something equally eclectic. And I have uh, uh, some storybooks from my childhood that I still find keep recurring in my own photography. I hope these quotations are of interest. For me, Tom Fran Francesconi's uh, point is, is very well made. A lot of my ideas simply come from being inspired by, by shapes and forms in a landscape. But ultimately, I really believe that this, the idea that ideas are the root of creation is very helpful when you're thinking about, about your own work. Because if you don't uh, draw from within, then you're not really creating. And to begin with, I think many of you will recognise the following picture. If we can get it to come up, which is is a uh, was hugely influential on me when I was young, and I think it, it was it, it was partly because the, the the simplicity, the geometry, the symmetry, asymmetry, which is such a powerful compositional tool, I believe, uh, and the quality of light. I mean, Ansel is throwing everything, in a sense, uh, at us with, with this picture. A great printer that he was as well. Uh, and, and this is a picture which simply inhabits some recess of my imagination. And while I'm by no means saying that this is the same composition, you can see how a picture like this is informed by the structure and the concepts that, uh, that, that came through Ansel Adams from my early days as a, as a student of both art and photography. But another big influence on me has always been painting because I was an art student first and foremost. I studied art history. Um, in fact, my first year at university, I studied art history with Neil McGregor, who is now the uh, director of the British Museum and arguably the most significant uh, art uh, curator on the planet. And Neil was a fantastic, uh, inspiring uh, speaker. And all his students were, were just captivated by, by his talks. He was in his late 20s back then, incredibly. Um, Turner was, uh, was one of the painters that, that we studied. And I'm, I guess some of you will perhaps have seen the latest film on, on JMW Turner. Not the most flattering portrait of the man, but uh, as an artist, I think his, his reputation uh, will, will always be uh, un, unchallenged, probably in the UK, as, as one of the most original uh, and dynamic artists of landscape, or indeed any subject. And this is quite poignant, because obviously it's not too far from where we are now. And you may see that this is actually almost not quite the same viewpoint, but very nearby also of Crummock Water. Uh, John and Rosamond are in the audience, I think, today, and they, they introduced me to this spot. Uh, and we were lucky enough to share this, uh, this rising sun uh, together uh, out there a couple of, well, actually, probably four or five years ago now, it seems. Uh, and it was only actually years later, uh, in fact, earlier this year, that I I found that painting of Turner's and saw the association. And I, I had seen it in the past, whether I was, I'm sure I wasn't trying to copy it, but it, it just is fascinating that these references abound. Now, I'm sorry it's a small reproduction that's just consistent with the resolution of the file, but this photograph uh, is from one of my favorite photographers, Peter Dombrovskis, great Tasmanian uh, photographer who died at the age of 53, which is were a real loss uh, to, to us. Uh, and Peter's work had a huge influence on me in the late 1990s uh, when I started using large format. Uh, and my original concept for the talk this morning was the unseen photographer. And the driving force behind that idea was Peter Dombrovskis. Because Peter's photography is, as it were to me, all about the subject matter. And you feel transported in his images to the place. And in order for that to really work, the photography itself tends to have to be quite quiet, not using extreme 
tactics of, of colour and light, uh, but something more reflective. Uh, and yet his work is extremely personal. And it's a fascinating uh, dilemma, in a way, that, that, this, that the work that we do, uh, if one is wanting to work in the eyewitness tradition, to continue to look at the, at the subject matter and to really probe deep into the subject matter and its quality uh, and what it means to you personally, that personal signature is almost always necessary to find uh, resonance for others. And surely we all want to communicate with our photography. Now, on a very different note, uh, this reproduction of Edvard Munch's very, very familiar painting of the screen, I have converted it to black and white for uh, deliberately just to make this transition a little bit easier to take. Um, this painting was hugely influential uh, in the 20th century. It still remains an icon of modern art. Uh, and I actually saw a, a Munch exhibition last year in Edinburgh, and, and, and this painting came back to haunt me. Uh, and I did find this uh, a fascinating uh, reflection on, on the screen. Uh, this is, picture was made in Svalbard. If you look at the form of, I think it's probably a beluga pelvic bone in the foreground, it seems to echo the skull-shaped uh, head uh, in, in Munch's scream image. Uh, and in many ways, for me, this picture is a kind of internal scream. Uh, and just the back story, it's a place in Svalbard where our ancestors uh, used to corral beluga whales into a bay, cut off uh, the uh, escape route for the whales at the back and then slaughtered them wholesale in this bay uh, because whaling was part of their culture and it was a very important part of early industrial process. And the beluga was highly prized for various reasons. And you go there today and the bay is, the entire high tide line of the bay is full of beluga bones and uh, the, the remnants of the process. As you can see, the old whaling boats as well are in there, rather echoing the sort of shape of a whale here. And this is a, a beluga uh, skull. You can't move or touch anything there because uh, it's, a, it's a kind of protected site. Uh, and it's very important, I guess, for future generations to keep it as unchanged as possible. As it, it is a, a really extraordinary kind of monument, in a sense, to uh, a bygone, fortunately, a bygone age. I've travelled quite a lot uh, in my career generally, and including last year to Colorado. Uh, and and uh, I've mentioned trying to make pictures that are quite quiet. And it's, it's very, uh, I think, I suppose, necessary as part of one's evolution uh, as, a, as a photographer, as, a, as an artist, call it what you will, as somebody who's, who's maybe a geographical labourer. I really like that phrase uh, from Jem's talk yesterday. Uh, but anyway, you continue to, to change and to develop your ideas, but you, you're still dependent on your, on your background and the things that, that you love. You can't just make pictures that you don't like. They still have to mean something to you. Uh, and as my language of light has probably become a little bit softer uh, and, uh, and more reflective, uh, I still find that I'm influenced by uh, people who've influenced me in the past, Ansel Adams again. Uh, I know that for many photographers, uh, Ansel Adams is, uh, our favorite pictures of Ansel's are often his small details. Uh, David mentioned the forest floor studies yesterday. Uh, and these aspens are uh, just outside Santa Fe. Actually went on a, a sort of pilgrimage uh, a few years ago to uh, New Mexico and, and explored that road where he photographed these trees. Uh, and just out of curiosity, wondering if I could possibly find them, which is a ridiculous idea because They've clearly grown up uh, over many, many decades since. Uh, but it was still a, a special experience for me to, to go back there. Uh, another source of ideas 
uh, a very, very important source for me is architecture. Uh, architects and masons are artists of stone. They're creating objects that are practical, that shelter us, that are places of worship, as in here, hence the, the, the kind of monumental form. This is Revo Abbey, quite close to home for me. And they are a source of ideas about perspective and proportion, shape and line, uh, and indeed the kind of spiritual aspirations in a, a building like this, using vertical emphasis to have our eyes, as it were, reaching to the heavens. Uh, and they're also a wonderful source of subject matter as a landscape photographer, just providing uh, a, a kind of um, a study in shape and, uh, and perspective, and, and particularly these kind of three-quarter glimpses. I, I love the complexity uh, of, of this kind of space. But studying architecture is a really, really useful thing to do in terms of ideas. When I was a student, uh, I did it, my first uh, sort of so what I regard as significant photography uh, on beaches mainly uh, in Cornwall and North Wales. And my driving force was the idea of energy and process, the cycles of, of life. Although mostly I, I photographed sand and rock and I was looking in a sense for metaphor and, uh, and perhaps sadly I'm still working on the same themes and ideas today, which does make me worry that I may not have moved on at all. Um, but nevertheless, I think that that too is part of, of the, the journey uh, that we make. There is no destination in that sense uh, as a photographer or an artist. You continue to try to develop, sometimes circulating around, coming back to the same place, uh, and, but perhaps with a slightly more mature or developed uh, take or uh, interpretation. A, a large part of that for me has been when I was younger working entirely in black and white, uh, looking at form, shape, texture, line, uh, all the things that Paul was describing yesterday morning, and then, uh, and then moving to colour for commercial necessity and discovering the joys of working in colour. Now, Another aspect of contemporary practice that is sometimes overlooked but is very, very important is that digital makes it very easy to make notes. And having shot with large formats for over 10 years between 1997 and, and 2008, I've become very, uh, I, th I suppose, devoted to the kind of single image process. And along the way, I'd, I'd often not so much missed pictures, but failed to take note of things. And it actually, it has been quite liberating to use a small camera or even a phone and make notes, just little ideas that one shoots as one goes along. And occasionally, when you look at them together, they kind of start to make sense in another way. So this is a collage of notes made on walks with rocks. And they're all shot between Salt Burn uh, on Teesside, uh, Redcar in Cleveland, in fact, and Scarborough in North Yorkshire. Still life is a genre of painting exemplified by uh, the sort of Dutch and, uh, and Spanish painters of the 17th and 18th century. And it, it, it's a field of, photograph of painting which uh, I, I never really got into personally, but Nevertheless, those images still haunt me. Pictures of feathers and fruits and bone and stone that uh, often sit on tabletops. And occasionally, a subject will come up where that kind of language, again, feeds back into my memory or through my memory into the way that I approach things. Now, you know, full disclosure, this shell duck on a beach in Rossilli was made while David and I were doing a workshop in the Gower last year. And... I think we all probably had a, had a go at photographing it. And, and it, 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 I, I think, I'm sure, that everybody approached it in their own way. So it wasn't a, a, a kind of ingenious discovery on my part, but one that we all uh, were able to enjoy together. But I think that the, 
uh, that the subject matter is, was just so powerful for me. Uh, I hope it, it finds uh, some meaning for, for anyone looking at it. Uh, but for me, the, the, the kind of beauty of living things in death is, is an important thing to study and, and to celebrate. Another painter whose work I absolutely love is Vasily Kandinsky, uh, the Russian father of abstraction, as some would say. And Kandinsky's pictures are incredibly dynamic, uh, lots and lots of diagonal lines. Uh, and this little rock detail in Cornwall made earlier this year, uh, for me, definitely references Kandinsky. Light itself is often a source of, of inspiration, as Rafa was saying yesterday. Uh, and this landscape in the Drakensberg uh, in South Africa uh, deliberately plays on uh, the forms created by crepuscular rays echoing the shapes of the landscape on the right-hand side of the image in the lower berg, or the, the uh, little berg as it's called there. And I suppose the previous picture hints at the idea of the sublime, uh, which Jen mentioned yesterday. And the sublime in art, still something that is, people tend to tread around quite carefully. Uh, fine art critics tend to be very, uh, well, let's say anti the sublime. I think it's probably fair to say, regarding it as irrelevant uh, and perhaps uh, out of keeping with the times. Uh, I always find that quite interesting because I can't think of anything more relevant uh, than the idea that we human beings find meaning and inspiration in nature. And in some ways it's the, the fearsome, the awesome, the awful aspects of, of nature that give us th that thrill. Uh, thinking of Jem's pictures of, uh, of rock falls uh, yesterday that we saw, that is actually all part of the same sense of, of what is this world that we live on that's constantly evolving on time scales so, so complex, so rich, that we can't necessarily uh, uh, get our heads around them except by a long period of thought and contemplation. Uh, and that's what I thought was so powerful about those images. This picture for me, slightly different in emphasis certainly, has a, a powerful memory element to it, which is that it is made in Antarctica after nearly, not quite three days, but almost three days at sea, the, the first two of which took place in more or less blanket fog. Uh, and although our wildlife photographers on board enjoyed watching the petrels and the albatrosses and sheer water uh, flying alongside the ship, for a landscape photographer, it was almost like sensory deprivation. I was looking out at this white whiteness and then and there was a wonderfully sort of biblical element to this so on the third day i rose uh, from my bed about four o'clock in the morning and went up onto deck and this is what i saw now antarctica has also other opportunities uh, which do include penguins uh, and there's an awful lot of them down there happy days um and but i I'm not a wildlife photographer and would never claim to be. So I wanted to, to see if I could challenge myself making a, a picture that was, was very personal. Well, I, I tried to do that all the time. And when I found this, uh, th th this whale vertebra at Coverville Island, it seemed like, a, uh, like it was designed to be photographed. In fact, it, it took quite a while, uh, about an hour, to, to resolve all these elements of the composition and then I just waited and waited and waited and made a few photographs as the penguins, once they become familiar with me being there, they just, they just continued their merry route uh, to, from their nesting sites uh, to the sea and back again, uh, carrying uh, their meals for their young. Um, and it was just a delightful experience, but the, the picture itself also carries that, for me, the narrative of of times past when this was also a major whaling era. Uh, and, and whales, uh, although they are uh, thriving to some extent in the Antarctic, uh, they're nowhere near as numerous as they once were. On a rather different note in a different location, this is 
back in the UK in the Northeast uh, and, and going from a, a kind of pristine coastal area to, uh, to Staithes uh, in North Yorkshire. Uh, it, this is, this is it's quite an interesting contrast. Uh, perhaps even more interesting when I tell you that the, the, this form here, which is the kind of obviously the heart of the composition, is actually a sewage pipe. Um, but I do really like that aspect of it because it, it, this is our landscape. This is where we live today. And these guys are fishing. Uh, not right, but they are right by the sewage pipe. I don't think the sewage pipe is still active, you'll be happy to hear. Uh, but, but it also uh, is, for me, uh, something that, that I'm starting to explore. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it later, the idea of, of figures in the landscape and how, how the, the message uh, is changed by, by figures in the landscape. Human beings, as David has said on numerous occasions uh, at workshops that, that, that we lead, figures tend to dominate pictures, which is absolutely true. Human beings are fascinated by other human beings, and any figure will tend to draw the eye. That doesn't necessarily mean that you can't photograph landscape with figures in, but you do need to understand the way that, that they, they will always, the eye, our eye will keep coming back to them, and they will tend to uh, have a, a, a powerful influence on the reading of the image. Uh, and also an aspect of uh, of practice, uh, to go back to that point, that I think is important is to stay with the subject for some time. Uh, and as the light changed through that evening, the fishermen continued to stay and, and fish. And there came a point just to, after the sun had set where this little gap in the cloud moved through and the sort of lit just underneath it. And you can see that little pool of light, which does animate that part of the image and they all suddenly started reeling their lines in at the same time, performing this little kind of dance together, which I thought was quite amazing. And they didn't know I was photographing them, by the way. So that is another example of the unseen photographer, perhaps. The equipment itself is a big influence on how we work. And it, it's undeniable, and it would be, it would be wrong to, to think differently. Photography has always, has always reflected technology, and technology available, and how inventive, creative, and innovative photographers have pushed the boundaries of technique as well, often pushing the manufacturers in the process. One of the, the really exciting developments for me over the last year has been the appearance of compact system cameras with full frame sensors. There's only the one system at the moment, that's Sony's A7R. Um, and that allows the introduction of a third party adapter onto which legacy lenses can be attached. And then you have a miniature view camera, which allows extraordinary control of focus, probably hitherto uh, impossible with such a, an incredibly small setup. And that means, too, that for an aging photographer like myself, I can travel uh, around the hillsides more easily. So that's exciting. Uh, and and it, it makes me feel that, that the life of, of the view camera uh, can be prolonged into, hopefully, into a greater age as well. And I'm not saying that entirely tongue in cheek. It, it is actually one of those things that's inevitable as you get older. You can't carry the same kind of weight over vast distances that you did in the past. And for me, that, that really does make a difference. The, this is actually made with a Linhof Techno and a Phase 1 back. Uh, again, an aspect of practice and inspiration together is that whereas with film, I, I love, I've always loved photographing flow, but now with digital, I'm able to make images with a little bit more sense of experimentation uh, and sometimes even to synthesize the same uh, different exposures from exactly the same composition. I know this is getting into possibly a, a, an area of the dark arts that will seem extremely controversial. Um, nevertheless, for myself, I still feel that, uh, that, that if you do everything that you do with an honest intention not to deceive, that is still acceptable. 
And photographers have made images with technique of various kinds, post-production, darkroom, whatever it may be, since the dawn of photography. The main thing is to, is to be true to yourself in the way that you express your ideas. And one of those, for me, that's very important is flow, uh, uh, the, the restless motion of water on the earth, and not just water, but also other forms of water, because it moves in a time scale that we can manage and, uh, and kind of evoke very uh, interestingly and creatively with, with exposure times, is, is one of the most exciting subjects of all for photography. I still take my camera with me on holiday, which uh, may shock some of you. Uh, my other half is extremely tolerant of, of that. In fact, she thinks it's important that I do take a camera with me on holiday, which is uh, for which I'm grateful. I don't always take a tripod, and I didn't on this occasion. Uh, this is a, a cave in Pembrokeshire. Uh, and you can see that there's a, a floor in the picture here, which is a little bit of out of focus rock ledge in the foreground. That's because I didn't have a tripod, so I had to put the, rock to, the camera down on the rock and uh, get that quite right. Um, but however, more to the point, this, this picture also references my memory of uh, a, a cartoon that we used to watch when we were children called Journey to the Center of the Earth. Anybody remember that? Yeah? Anybody as old as me here? <laughs> so one, of you, one or two of you are. <laughs> so, and, and there was this there was this tunnel that you see our adventurers going down in the, at the beginning and end of, of each of, of, of those episodes. Uh, and it was on this kind of diagonal. And the strange thing was they were going towards this light, which is pretty odd when you think of going down into the center of the earth. But anyway, here we are. Um, this is obviously looking towards the mouth of a cave. Also, this is another big rule breaker. So completely, completely and utterly blown the file here. This is shot with a Fuji X-C1 uh, camera, digital camera. And the highlights are nowhere to be seen. They're gone. Um, does that make it a hopeless picture or a bad picture? I don't think it does. I think breaking technical rules is a very, very important part of photography. Uh, and there, there are times when, especially overexposure, massive overexposure, evokes a feeling of light in a way that, that can't be achieved in any other way. And I think that is also a creative aspect of photography. Now, another. Uh, a little bit of popular culture I'm referencing, uh, talking about films or TV. This is definitely a film. And I'm sure most of you will remember Indiana Jones and the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, the opening sequence where he's uh, going and finding that gold icon in the Mexican cave. Uh, and then there's a, a series of obstacles for him as he escapes. And one of them is an enormous, gigantic boulder. These pesky boulders, they get all over the place, don't they? Anyway, that is uh, in the Drakensberg in South Africa. And I mean, it's just a remarkable place to visit. Seven miles walk in, um, and well, you do get a great reward at the end of it. And if anybody's wondering, this, this is water, falling water. Uh, the, the, the color, the blue, comes from the blue sky, which is just entrapped. But, uh, but actually, I. I <laughs> When I shot the picture, I wasn't thinking Indiana Jones, but I, I do remember as soon as I looked at it, once I got it back on the computer, I thought, I've seen that before. And it was almost the same camera angle as the, uh, the one used in Raiders of the Lost Ark. So finally, uh, and I've gone on far too long as usual, uh, a little bit on my own personal work. I'm going to have to rush through these fairly quickly. What I feel I'd like my work to be about. I suppose I still feel it's very much work in progress. I definitely reference my memory. Uh, I would like, generally, to express a feeling of hope, because I think that no one can do without it. Uh, and if, if any pictures, uh, as it were, find a life beyond the making, and some of them, I suppose, perhaps do, and will mean things to other people as well, then maybe they have some sense of transcendence, which uh, is something to aspire to, I hope. And because I've overrun so badly, I'm very conscious of that, I'm going to run through these quite quickly. Uh, and I hope you'll forgive me for doing that. Uh, but pictures that are of trees tend to be my favorite kind of thing at the moment. And 
whether they're from Colorado or from the Lake District last week. Uh, I'm finding whether it's backlit sunlit or rain, as in the previous picture. They're trying to express something more than just a tree. Trees are incredibly complex, as we, we, we saw yesterday, the way that Jem deals with that all the time in his work, and it's a, it's a continuing problem and a challenge for us as photographers, the complexity of it. Some places are a little bit easier to photograph, but I'm still trying to find some feeling or expression in the arrangement here. sometimes perhaps sinister. Wider landscape, but the dark note of the burnt trees in the foreground is very important to the way that this composition works. And moving to a slightly different theme of ice, almost an abstraction and yet not. These are mostly very, very recent images, exploring some themes that are, uh, well, almost all of them are, are themes with which I'm familiar. So color relationships, particularly here. And some perhaps less so. This is the Bistai Badlands in New Mexico. Flow, this time flow with, not with water but with the residue of water. Flash floods come through this area frequently. Actually, that's not true. They don't come through that frequently, but when they do, they change the landscape completely, which tends to emphasize the extraordinary differences that there are in geology, from the very friable mudstone of the Bistai to the soaring granite mountains of Baffin Island, which also, for me, remind me of, of uh, Yosemite and Ansel Adams. And yet Baffin Island also offers these kinds of, uh, of experiences too. The granite is still there, but it almost seems to have dissolved into the sky. A bit closer to home. Saltwick Bay with a storm front approaching. And salt, actually it's not salt burn, it's red car, the new red car turbine farm. And the pier on the left. It was only after I'd made this picture I realized that, that it, there was some kind of quite powerful symbolism in, in a storm raging over a wind farm because that happens all the time in the north of England and Scotland. There's so many new wind farms being proposed, erected, uh, and now operational, uh, but invariably they're controversial, uh, and, and yet they are also a vital part of our landscape now. This is Glen Affric, and I'm still inspired by light as subject. And finally, a little sequence of pictures which perhaps for me, illustrate where I might be going with my photography, more looking at, at figures in the landscape. This is a game of cricket at 16,500 feet above sea level in Ladakh. Whereas this is at sea level in Saltburn. You may recognize a certain editor of On Landscape in this picture. And Jem mentioned the industrial sublime yesterday. And uh, I think Tim and I both used that very same phrase when this picture was being made. And finally, picture from, come on, <laughs> try again. Ah, from a place I know and love, Saltwick Bay. Uh, when David saw this yesterday, he said, is that a selfie? which was, uh, was quite an apposite uh, comment because that's my son, Sam, 
Uh, and in many ways, it is a self-portrait. Uh, my, my son studying earth sciences at university, uh, so he's a, effectively a geologist, looking at a setting sun, as it were, uh, and I kept finding myself thinking there's some very, very strange references in this image. Um, it even has the kind of dark note of a black nab, like death coming. Um, so <laughs> I, 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 did, I did find uh, that, you know, I, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm reading too much into things, but, but actually uh, I, I think it's important to remember that there is metaphor and symbolism in photography, and that that's one of the things that makes it exciting, beguiling, and constantly inspiring. Thank you very much indeed.